Welcome to The Pointy End. I'm Keith Sutherland. Today my guest is Lisa Chesters, Federal Member for Bendigo. Lisa, welcome. Thanks, Keith. It's great to be back on the program. Good. Now, we'll just touch briefly on the terrible situation in Brussels last night. Who would have thought the airport and the train station? And um, I contacted my son, who's over there, he used to go and spend a lot of time in Brussels working. But, yeah, terrible situation. But that's part of our world now, which is sad. And it sends a shock through everyone because we are so mobile these days. People travel to lots of different places. Um, you expect these things to occur, say, in um, developing countries, but you don't expect them to occur where it's the home of the EU. Um, I've been to Brussels, great part of the world. In fact, you know, most of Europe is. So they've clearly got some social issues that they have to work through. And I think that one of the things that we're doing really well in this country is that we've identified problems early and are really working with the Australian Muslim community or the any community really to get on top of any kind of threats of violence. Yeah, terrible situation. Anyway, lots happened in this last week and who Huge would have thought? Week. <laughs> Amazing. Now, um, the PM has thrown down an ultimatum to either pass the um, ABCC um, legislation or else um, he's going to call election. And you guys have to go back to Parliament on the 18th of April. So, well, caught a few people by surprise, not so much that part of the um, putting the gun up the heads of the senators, but the fact that you've got to go back um, three weeks early or four weeks early than was expected. So was it a smart strategy or was it um, trying to be too clever? What do you think about it all? It caught me by surprise. I really didn't think that the Prime Minister would threaten to go to a double disillusion election where they dismissed dismiss both houses on the issue of the ABCC. I just did not think it would happen. Uh, it's quite an obscure thing to do because a lot of Australians don't even know what the ABCC is and don't even think that we have a problem in the construction industry. So it's it's odd. It's not an issue that people raise with you. They'll bring up Centrelink, they'll bring up um, childcare funding or childcare fees, but they don't bring up the ABCC when you talk to them in the street. Uh, I'm also not sure what I'll do when I get back to Canberra. So we have to return um, as a lower house to wait to receive the message from the Senate if and when they vote on the ABCC. Uh, and there's, we don't know what the plan is for the lower house and what we'll be debating. Um, you know, they're doing a lot of valedictory speeches at the moment. The, the government- Very much so. Yeah, the government has really, they don't have an agenda um, or a plan for the lower house. So unless they've got new legislation, a lot of the stuff that I spend a lot of my time on my feet speaking about is legislation that's been to the house three or four times before. Seems like a clever idea though, because it's a win-win whatever happens. He wins if the Senate pass that. Now with the voting changes to the Senate having gone through with the Greens and Liberal Party support. He also wins if he doesn't get it through. So he goes to a double dissolution, goes to the Governor-General, 2nd of um, July, we're having a double dissolution election. So it's a win-win for him, but is it a win-win for democracy? It's not a win-win for democracy, and I don't know if it's going to be a win-win for the Prime Minister, because I think Australians are quite cynical and cynical about this move. Uh, the Prime Minister, if he um, only waited a couple of weeks, he could go to a normal election. Uh, the election is due in September, so we could... The reason why they're calling back Parliament early is because they've actually run out of time to, to have a DD before we fall into the window period of a, no, a normal election. Um, what Australians also don't like is revenge politics, and that's what this kind of feels like. It's, you didn't do what I want, so I'm now going to force the issue, go to a DD, and basically you lose your job. So it sounds a bit like revenge politics. Uh, most Australians really respect that the Senate is supposed to be a house of review. Yes, we need to look at Senate um, voting reforms, but my problem with the ones that have been pushed through is that it didn't actually reflect what the original committee was asking for. And there's still a lot of unknowns about the reforms that have been pushed through. Been a fair bit of criticism towards the Labor Party because Gary Gray did support it. You did support it, as you mentioned though wasn't the same legislation that was put to Parliament and it was probably purposefully done that way. Um, the other point I just want to pick up on was that you mentioned um, that there seems to be lack of policy and when there is policy, it gets overturned all the time. You saw that with the Safe Schools program that um, Tony Abbott introduced and all of a sudden everyone was happy, but then now they're unhappy with parts of it because they're really, Tony Abbott's side are really having a go at um, the Malcolm Turnbull side is it really all about this election, about Malcolm Turnbull trying to get some authority, some status for himself? Because even yesterday you saw 
he, he really reacted when Tony Abbott said, well, he's happy to support Malcolm Turnbull going to the election because it's all on his policy. So is he trying to establish himself as PM because he's been pretty ineffectual so far? And I don't think that would change if he wins the election. And that's the other thing, that's the other challenge that he has. Like, I, I believe that the PM is desperate. I believe that um, the talk about a DD has come from other parts of his cabinet and he's now sort of supporting that. Um, it's been heavily pushed by people like Christopher Pine in the past. But I think with um, this Prime Minister, with um, Turnbull, the issues that he has in his backbench aren't going to go away. Tony Abbott is contesting the next election. Kuru Bernardi is contesting the next election. All of his current issues with the radical right that he has in his party, they are all standing for re-election. So there's no given like post the election that it would change because all of his issues are still there. Uh, I think that the talk about the election does one thing. It gets us talking about election and we're not talking about policy. Uh, they're going to have a budget on the 3rd of May. They changed the date without even telling the Treasurer. Like, how that. dysfunctional are you as a government that you don't even tell the Treasurer that you've changed the date of the, um, the budget? Is the Treasurer involved in writing the budget? Who's writing the budget? What's in the budget? That is the purpose of government, is to govern and have a vision and have a plan. And the great thing about talking about an election, will it, won't it happen, and about an obscure part of the law in the Senate is you're not talking about the budget. This time last year, the year before, every year in March, April, there's a lot of talk about what should or should not be in the budget. Great game of distraction if you're talking about if and when there might be an election instead of the budget. I'd like to come to some of those budget issues or um, issues full stop, basically, but you mentioned about will it be any different after the election? Erica Betts is number one on the Tasmanian Senate ticket. so. That right wing element is still going to be there regardless, so that's never going to go away. And I'll just pick up something as well about Gary Gray. The government is being really cheeky here in misrepresenting what he said. There was a bipartisan committee that was formed to look at electoral matters, and they um, put forward a report that was endorsed by the whole committee. The government then went away and drafted legislation based upon that report, uh, locked Labor out of those discussions, uh, worked with the Greens on that, did a deal with the Greens and Nick Xenophon, and then tabled the bill in Parliament. So we didn't even get a chance to check. The committee didn't even get a chance to check to see if the bill before the House reflected what they recommended in the report. And as we discovered from all the comments from people like Anthony Green, who's respected in this space, um, there were a lot of weaknesses and problems with what was put forward and it didn't pick up all the recommendations that were suggested by the committee. So it's really easy to say, ha ha, he disagrees with you, but they were talking about two very different things. Interesting on this um, issue, the Greens, there's been a lot of stuff on social media, uh, anti what the Greens did, but it has been a policy for 10 or 12 years to change the voting reform. But the point you make is it wasn't quite at this stage, but the Greens did approve it. So um... and and also too, they um, it also showed how um, like blind they can be. Uh, I have an issue with um, ticket um, voting tickets and sort of the way in which they're done. But the Greens said, okay, we'll sacrifice every other principle that we have on voting electoral reform to just abolish that one issue. Uh, we don't quite know how the preferences are going to work in the Senate. Uh, the optional preferential above, below, what's actually going to happen. I think that it's going to change the face of the way the Senate looks and I don't believe that it will be as representative as people hope it would be going forward. I'll ask that question. You better um, draft it for me because we have the Greens leader coming on, um, Richard Di Natale, in, um, in a couple of weeks, so that'll be oh, good. Oh, great. Um, now, moving on, we talked about before some issues coming up and there has been a lack of issues. In all fairness, the Labor Party have got the negative gearing. I'd like to discuss that, but when I put it on Twitter the other day about you coming on the program, came through loud and clear in this area, NBN, slow speeds, um, internet. It just seemed to be, that seems to be the number one issue. I know you've got health and education. That's always there, that's a give me. But the NBN seemed to be the thing that people came back to me on Twitter, ask Lisa, what's she doing about the NBN? And I know that there's criticism. They think, well, Labor didn't really have a full understanding of what they were doing under Stephen Conroy, but under Malcolm Turnbull, it seems to have gone from bad to worse. Now we're never going to get the speeds. We're now talking about the thin um, fibre as opposed to fibre to the node. People want to know where we're at, and Bendigo seems to be the poor relation, as I'm reading and listening to the public in Bendigo. 
I completely agree with you and it's the issue that comes up the most in the office and I, I've been holding lots of forums around um, the issue of MBN and the lack of fast speed broadband and very vocal on this issue in the parliament. Uh, what I will say is that prior to the election there was a plan in place and that we would start to get fibre to the premises run out to our households and businesses here in Bendigo. Uh, we were to come just after Ballarat and you know it's that horrible moment where Ballarat uh, they got their contract signed before the last election, so they are getting um, a lot of fibre to the premises rolled out where we uh, haven't. Uh, since then, so the government gets elected, Malcolm Turnbull um, tears up the plan and for two years um, starts to consult, changes MBN Co and starts to bring in all these different technologies. The problem is, is that those technologies are already out of date. So fibre to the node that's being rolled out, there's a number of issues because they didn't quite appreciate the government, how degraded the copper was in some areas. So it's this crazy situation where factories overseas in, um, in parts of Europe and Asia have had to fire up and start creating ca um, copper cable and are supplying copper cable to Australia to buy to do the fibre to the node um, project. Like they stopped um, making fibre to, um, copper cable in the world because it was like outdated technology. And here Australia is buying copper, bringing it into this country to, um, finish, to build the second half of the NBN because it's degraded. Uh, in central Victoria, it's a perfect storm. We have ageing infrastructure. Telstra um, hasn't invested, and understandably so, they thought the MBM was coming in. So they sort of slowed their investment into ADSL lines. At the same time, a lot of people moving into Bendigo um, and wanting access. So we have more users, more homes, more businesses. And then at this, and their technology has improved. Um, people wanting to um, watch programs like this program on their phone, on their TVs, at home. People wanting to do more with their devices. Today we have three or four um, smart devices in our homes. Uh, Ten years ago that just didn't exist. So it's a perfect storm for us here in Central Victoria. And it's a mess and the government just needs to fix it. And it is just taking way too long, way too long. Um, your colleague um, Jason Clear was sat in the chair uh, about a month ago and said that um, they have to order copper to go from Singapore back to Australia. So how mm. ridiculous is that? Yeah. But we'll move on to negative I would, gearing. Sorry, I probably on. should just say Labor's plan is for there to be more fibre. If we are successful in the next election and get to get to the privilege of being in government, uh, Jason Clare, the shadow, um, shadow um, communications minister, has said that uh, we've got to see which contracts has been um, signed yep. and the stage of the rollout that they are, but wherever possible, um, introduce more fibre, fibre to the premises, fibre to the driveway, so that we don't see a situation where they lay copper and then maybe five years, ten years later have to go back and lay um, fibre. It's the way of the future and we just need to basically see it happen. Totally agree. Now, negative gearing, you've been on the front foot about that and that's been a, one of the biggest scare campaigns we've seen so far. And I only put on Facebook this morning, Shaw Leeslake and John Grattan from the, um, no, John Daly from the Grattan Institute talking about all this scare campaign is so totally wrong. And I believe it is because, in my opinion, as a real estate agent, I've seen what's happened with negative gear private. I've taken advantage of us, I openly admit it. But at the end of the day, I've got kids too that need to buy houses and they're being pushed out of the market because how do you compete with an investor? I think it's a win-win because you get jobs with construction. Um, on new properties are negatively geared, still there. Um, but it just seems to be that scare campaign by Scott Morrison, um, Treasurer, and of course Malcolm Turnbull, but um, he's gone a bit quiet on that because there's more issues at the moment talking about A, B, double C. Uh, I agree with you. And you think back to why they introduced negative gearing in the first place. They said it was about creating housing stock, rental stock. Uh, and what we've seen is um, there are lots of properties for rent available in Bendigo and you see the signs going up everywhere, um, but there aren't, it's almost like we have an oversupply of, of rentals, like rental properties and not enough people looking for rent. So there's something quite unique going on here in Bendigo at the moment, and that may not last. What I really respect about our policy is anyone who currently negative gears a property is not affected whatsoever. They can continue to negative gear their property. It's about future properties and it's about sort of saying, well, um, 
and house prices will still continue to go up, but they won't go up at the rapid um, increases that we've seen in the last five years. This is, this is about saying, if you want to negative gear a property for tax purposes, we want you to invest in new property, which will help, like you said, kickstart the housing industry. You, we will see a lot more tradies um, getting work. There'll be a lot more construction jobs, but it will also help us tackle some of those other housing issues that we have locally. Uh, I just bumped into um, someone who works at Haven Home Safe on my way here today. This is just such a great opportunity to talk about social housing enterprises and about attracting investors into social housing projects or looking at disability housing or other areas where we don't currently have stock. Um, not everyone in Bendigo and Central Victoria wants a three bedroom, one bathroom house. So is there a way that we can use tax incentives and policy to encourage investors into other spaces where we do need to create housing stock. And that's that exciting opportunity that exists under that policy. I should also say too, a lot of people who own property actually don't do it for tax purposes to negative gear. They actually do it to make money. So we'll still have investors rocking up to, um, to auctions to buy houses because there are some people who are in the industry to actually make money. Yeah. And I agree as a real estate agent. Mm. Now, bring it back to the local scene. Um, you've got about a 1.3% margin. Um, you're hoping for better. You, you are lucky, I guess, being the incumbent, of course. And also your party has got lots of policies out there, uh, as opposed to Megan Purcell, the Liberal candidate, who's your major competitor. Um, the Liberal Party haven't got, and she's been caught up with a reality TV show. So you've got the jump but your 1.3% margin is not a lot, so you've, and you've worked the electorate, there's no question about that. Um, what do you see as the local big issues that you'd really like to um, enhance, continue on with? I know you've been an advocate for many, many things around the community, but what do you see as the big issues other than NBN um, um, and also negative gearing and a few other things? Well, I mean, MBN is just at the top of the list, that's for sure. Uh, the, another big issue is around hidden poverty and the fact that there are lots of people in Bendigo that are doing it really tough. Uh, the, the pressure on kind of households is um, a lot of pressure on, the cost of the basics have just gone up. So more and more people asking for help from our food relief agencies and just are struggling to get by. So. There is, um, that is one of those issues that I think that I'd like to see talk about. How can we uh, see investment in community um, to make sure that our agencies are able to help those in need, but we're also helping people get on top of those cost of living pressures. Another one is jobs. We do have a youth unemployment problem here in Central Victoria. A lot of young people saying they just can't get their first job to get the experience to then move into their second job. And that could be uh, a student that's studying, can't find a decent part-time job. That could be someone who's just finished university who can't get that first job in their preferred career. Or it could be the apprentice. Um, we've got a fraction of apprenticeships today here locally in Bendigo than what we had a generation ago. So, and another issue that locally will be big uh, is in terms of clean energy um, and making sure that we are seeing that smart investment in renewable energy, solar panels on roof, making sure that we've got options around, around those issues. That will also come up a bit too. How are you going to get traction in those areas? Because whilst I agree with you, they're all very important, but what you're going to see, and you mentioned it yourself yesterday, that job, youth, unemployment mm. was one of the top um, of your agenda as well. But having seen where Malcolm Turnbull's going with this, you said you don't want to be bogged down with the A, B, double C legislation. Then Jackie Lambie on Q&A on Monday night said that she was privileged enough to see the Dyson Hayden Royal Commission interim report and she didn't see anything ill about mm. that. But of course, Malcolm Turnbull's going to say, this is the big issue. Mm. So he's going to be hammering that away with unions You've got to try and get the other. How do you get the traction out there? Because the media, mainstream media, are not really picking it up. Are you getting traction locally? Uh, and I think that that's the thing I love about um, Central Victoria and Bendigo is when, like, because since the last election and, and, and even before, I've continued to do the Listening Post program. So, you know, twice a week sort of out there just chatting to people as they come in and raise issues. 
I find by keeping up local and listening to people and talking about what matters to them, that's how you can help change the conversation or, or focus on other things. With the ABCC, it's just so obscure to people, they just don't engage with it. It's just a bit of white noise that's going on. So people actually find it really refreshing when you're talking to them about resources for their kids' school or about living longer, living better, aged care packages, or about Centrelink or about sport, any other issue but what is being talked about in the Canberra bubble, people actually kind of engage. I oh, thank God you're not like every other politician. So it is about sort of staying on a local message and engage with what people are saying locally. Um, the power of social media, um, Facebook, Twitter, but also just the power of face-to-face -face conversations and just chatting to people one-on-one. -on -one. And I also have to say a big shout out to our local media who don't get caught up in those Canberra issues. Um, the conversations that I've had with sort of the Bendigo Weekly and with our radio stations locally, they actually want to focus on well, what should be the key issues for this area in the upcoming election. But more importantly, for the budget, there will be a budget on the 3rd of May. And I've got some asks that I want to see funded in the 3rd of May budget. Um, just on um, the last issue that I want to talk about, was I've, I've seen the last week you've been the radio star on with Coggo, so that's been entertaining, obviously. But coming back to the media issues, because this is something that has been a long time coming. Um, Stephen Conroy, sitting where you sat, said about, oh yeah, Bendigo IPT, fantastic, what a great initiative. Malcolm Turnbull said it recently on the ABC, mm. but we get no support from mm. anybody. Mm. We do it ourselves, we do it voluntary yeah. to try and bring local people up to local issues, but we get no support. Dennis went off his brain last week on Head to Head about all the politics, they talk about it, mm. but no support. Is there anything that you can see to assist us, to keep us going? Because we're the only ones that, other than Wynn, doing a small amount of um, local news, mm. we're the only ones that are bringing local issues to the fore. And it, you're right, there, the fund doesn't exist to help um, news organisations like yours that are basically not-for-profit locally run services tap into funding. We, um, we have an established fund to help community radio stations but there is no fund that's been established at a federal level to help basically community issues current, based, and current affairs based programs like Bendigo IPTV and it quite frankly is because it hasn't been created yet. So it, it's one of those policy decisions and how do we make it a priority for a government to do that and to make that happen. The other thing that's always complex that I discovered going to Canberra about, um, about politics in this space around media uh, the big media outlets have a very big say about what happens, very big say. So they have a big say about what happens at the ABC, they have a big say about what happens at SBS. They are incredibly fearful of what's going on in the social media and online space uh, and feel like they can't compete. So they are very active when it comes to any funding that's being put forward for community or independently based news um, resources and services. So I think our challenge is how do we get it to be on the agenda and get the people who've been in the box seat to actually put the funding out there um, to give organisations and programs like yours the opportunity to basically apply for it. We will ask you to wave the flag in Canberra I on will. our behalf, <laughs> on behalf of Bindi IPTV. Yeah. Lisa, there was so much more to get through, but oh. anyway, I really appreciate you coming on the program between now and probably the 2nd of um, July. There'll be plenty of other opportunities to talk about many issues and um, also what's going on in the local scene. So thank you very much for appearing on The Pointy End today. Oh, it's great to be back, Keith, and any time. Thank you.